problem. I'm trying to teach footwork. Teach the footwork first as a skill. Give them different types of ways to access that footwork. Then, perhaps, in that sequence of scaffolding, throwing a frisbee at them and having them move out of the way will be a good way to reinforce the footwork that you've introduced. But if I just say, hey guys, let's play frisbee, and I start whipping frisbees at your head, and I say, okay guys, get out of the way, look how bad your footwork is. Well, of course your footwork's going to be bad. You haven't introduced it as a skill to be learned. So, as with anything, it's very important we break it down into the smallest possible pieces. Very often, when I'm teaching, I'll have four or five chunks intended, but based on what I see in the feedback from my students, the difficult, the problem areas that I'm seeing, I will take the step we're on and subdivide it two or three more times. I will sub-chunk it, if you will, further and further and further until I know the student is getting it. Most of the greatest innovations I've come up with are in the midst of that kind of conflict. When I see a student is really not understanding something, it forces me to raise my game up and look for new ways and to come up with new and creative exercises that can help them better feel this. So, chunking is breaking down any one movement or idea, strategy, tactic, technique, into small, bite-sized pieces. Nothing can be too small. If it's interesting and it's challenging, keep on sub-chunking. Scaffolding is any pathway that will help you get to that given chunk. Any idea, concentration, focus, game, drill. But it only works as scaffolding if you are starting with the problem, with the chunk that you're trying to reinforce, and that you are customizing that game or that exercise or that, that movement, that whatever the drill is going to be, towards that end goal. Don't just say, well, dodging a ball is good for head movement, let's just dodge a ball. You have to go there, teach the skill, introduce it, rehearse it, practice it, add pressure, add variability, then we have scaffolding. So in all of my lesson planning, my drill set will normally be an idea. My sub-drills in that set will be chunks, and sometimes I will have under them further subdivisions, which are scaffolding. Specific exercises, emphases on breathing, on contraction, on mindset, analogies, comparisons, anything that will support and allow that student to find a way to remember it and access that chunk. And next up, we're going to be taking a look at six different flow methodologies that we can use in our teaching. The first type of flow is what we term a countermeasure flow. In this case, we start with a basic idea, our basic mount defense. Mount defense. The student bridges with their hips, forcing the attacker to post their hands on the ground, and then reaches up, trapping the arm, and rolling the subject to that direction. Once the students get a basic familiarity with that, then we begin to educate the attacker. And the attacker starts to free their arm from that snare. Once, twice, giving them resistance, adding friction to the drill. This forces the defending student on the bottom to adapt to the aggressor. It forces them to look for different options. And oftentimes they'll create their own defenses, partially wrapping the shoulders or grabbing around the leg or even the waist in order to better trap the subject and complete that fundamental, basic, orthodox bridge roll. As we continue to educate the attacker, making them more and more resistant, I'm going to transition over to the class soundtrack so you get a better idea of what we're teaching. We're bumping, we're going for arms, we're doing all this fighting, we're here, you know, we can't get the arms so we take the body or whatever we need to, but if he wants to really hook on, two things he'll do is he'll either grapevine both like that, and he'll take me down, or that's it. So if I get stuck in this position, I know that wrestling it is not going to work. So the only way out is to sneeze the legs out. Both legs have to go completely straight. I can't be tentative. If I do it half, <laughs> it's going to hurt both of us. So straight toes are in upward alignment and somewhat retracted. So the backs of my knees hit the floor. If I do that, I'll get out. Don't let it happen. I'm going to show you 80%. <laughs> it's so bad. <laughs> no good. 100, you can do one, two, right? Or you can both is better. So again, it's tailbone, straight, toes back. That's what I want to do. 
if somebody's super long, like a six foot five or whatever, uh, when I did it with Nico, for example, I, I bumped under here like that, right? I did a little lift to see this tight. I bump under here and I Indian suplex up and that'll make his legs tighter along with other things. Dress me tighter and then pop and that makes it easier. So those are some options. But if that if that's failing and some flexible guys will crisscross it here like this and it's hard to activate your muscles and get in here and, and cause enough pain. So a good base is to always touch your foot. It's like a little island in your flexibility and then to come down. It's going to give you more height. If I just start doing this sometimes in the fight, I start to cramp. I can get hamstring cramps. So bring it up and then come down. That's going to give you the most height you can and you start to work it apart. Right? And I'll just keep doing that. I'll just keep swimming up to my knees and that'll give me, especially when I'm lactic, it'll give me the most height to get underneath. And again, under here, over on top. As soon as I get a leg down, if I have a guy like that, I'll put a leg down in the center and then this way he can't get me. So again, he's got me locked up. Just doing this, you can get away with it. Some guys will do that and crank. If Ian was doing it on me, this position is not great for me and he's more flexible, so he'll be okay. But if you're older and tired and lactic, you wanna take those rests and just keep swimming like that. That'll give you more openings and get a leg down. Get a leg down right away. And then it's your choice. I could from that position, watch, if I'm center, I can step out and then whoop, just go from there with one hook and then get, that's for a flat person, yeah? That's it, just for legs. One key thing is to make sure you adapt to the needs and the capacities of the students. In this case, I had a question about how best to bridge from a low mount, if it was possible to bridge with grapevines in. And so what I do here is a little ad lib, adding yet another level of education to the aggressor and to the defender as well. So any low mount, the key is I have to trap one arm. I usually do it this way low so it's going to be an underhook with a head grab. Other hand is in a butterfly and it's what we refer to as a baton pass, like in a relay. I bridge to my max, that's my max. See? And just before I get there, this is the spark and then my arm takes over. But this is my maximum bridge, that's about as much height as you're going to get. It's not going to be enough, which is why you normally need to go pump. And then I like to go to Keza. So it's hard, right? If you're, if you're with a child or somebody like 100 pounds, long and skinny, 6'2", 110, maybe you'll get out. But usually the grapevines, it's tough. You gotta, you gotta sneeze out. You always, uh, once you've gotten out of the, the grapevine, yeah. do you always get a leg or not necessarily? Not necessarily, not necessarily. Punish him with your pubis. See, I, I go back again, Ian. Yes. Go as hard as you can. I bet you. So do the bridge and get one hand in your crease under his groin. Okay. I bet you, you are. His legs are tense enough. You're strong, but I bet you it's gonna hurt. Just you getting that harness, the crotch harness. Watch this. Yeah, you're gonna love it. So you're gonna flare him out as tight as you can. So Ian, you're gonna bridge and then slip it under. Yeah, that's it. Now put your hand. Yeah, that's it. Look at that. It takes it right off. Now watch for the triangle. Yeah, that's it. Because he's, if he's good, he'll oh, go yeah. to a triangle right away. That's it. So then I'll smash it. I'll just throw it over and pass. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So watch. Okay. For, at first, let him try to get your arm. Play with him. Pull him out a few times. Pull him out. And then whenever you're done with that, David, before he catches you, flatten out. Get those grapevines in. Hook him flat. If you can't, crisscross it. Oh, yeah. Oh, Beautiful. Right. So now, Ian, it's your turn. You're on the back. He's trying to do a standard mount escape. Boom. That's it. Standard mount. Don't let him get those arms. Pull those arms up. Pull those arms. As soon as you want to, grapevine or crisscross. That's it. So now you feel it in context. Now you got to go in context. That's it. Get it. Yes. That's it. So what it teaches you to do is immediate response. The longer you reside and rest, the harder it is. Your body gets painful. Get out right away. Bounce. 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 Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Oh. Here comes the clean I like to think of the countermeasure drill as being an effort to sort of follow a straight path. In this case, we're trying to do a basic mount escape, but we saw that our attacker or our partner can begin by adding the resistance of removing their arms, their basic arm shrugs, pulling their arms out of any traps that you give them. And this is a great first 
test for your adaptability. As you start to get better at dealing with arm shrugs, we saw the top person could flatten out by acquiring grapevines with their legs, flattening out and hooking their legs in. If the grapevines aren't available, we saw that they could also use crisscross of their ankles around the hips or the buttocks. This allows them to latch on and stay low. But no matter what they would do, the ultimate goal is for us to try to get back to our original path of escaping that mount, bridging out, and rolling. So in a lot of ways, it's kind of like you're going up a flight of stairs or up a ladder, and you're, an encounter, you're encountering opponent after opponent, resistance after resistance, and you're simply knocking them out of the way, getting rid of that difficulty, but not allowing yourself to be pulled off on a tangent, always coming back to the original course of completing that bridge roll in whatever manner you can. Now, the next drill is another form of attack and defense drill. It's what I term the volley drill. The volley drill is really like a very, very dangerous tennis match where both the attacker and the defender takes turns winning. Here's an example. Let's say I begin with something simple like a far side body lock. I practice and train acquiring the far side body lock with all of the correct mechanics. Then once I've got a grasp on it, my partner blocks that, in this case using a simple arm block. So now I look at different counters. I could do an over wrap and a whizzer. In this case, I go for an arm stuff. So now I stuff the arm, pushing it into the partner's body, and I include it inside the body lock. And I succeed once again with the far side body lock. Now my partner allows me to develop my skill set on that. And then once I'm comfortable and strong, he takes turns now acquiring a high underhook. The high underhook will prevent me from acquiring that stuff and once again will block me from getting that far side body lock. Now I look at going to the close side body lock. Since he blocks the far side, I say fine, I take the close side. I go for a close side body lock. Again I acquire some skill on that and then once that's comfortable, he counters all of it by learning how to block the body lock entirely. In this case, we use a simple bridge arm in the face and we sag with our body to break the grip. So this is a good way to learn how to both educate the attack and the defense. It makes it interesting for both partners because we both take turns winning in the drill and we learn how to become more adaptable. Uh, it also gives us a nice flow, a cooperative but somewhat resistant segue towards more full pressure testing. Now, our third type of flow set that we can use for teaching is what I commonly term a chain flow set. It's a basic sequence of movements, one that can lead into the other, into the other, into the other. Now, the idea with a chain flow set is not necessarily that you would ever perform six or seven moves in a, in a sequence. It's more a question of linking movements. A can lead to B, B could lead to C, but you could also just start by being in position E and go either to F or back to D. It's a, it's a question of linkage and not a question of specific choreography. So here's just one possible example. Imagine from a mounted position that we begin with a basic figure four V lock. We can teach and chunk down all of the acquisitions of that lock. Then once that skill set is comfortable, we could say to ourselves, how could we transition to, for example, a one handed arm snake lock. From that position we could then look at how we could use our free arm to perform a cross face lock. From the face lock we could look at underhooking the head and going into a one-armed stockade. If our subject was to push that cradle control off, we could look at how we could slide over the head and push back with the elbow to create a deepened shoulder separation. If at that point we imagine either the partner escapes and the arm becomes lax, or because he slips out, we lose our grip, we lose a bit of adhesion, then we could go to an underhook trap. And then finally, we could see that we could raise that subject up into an underhook arm bar. So the idea here is that we have a sequence of moves that flow each into the other, but not necessarily that you would ever perform this sequence in whole. They're just basic ideas in mental mapping so that we understand how locks can fit together. They deepen our understanding of the body and our capacity can, to control it and they start to teach you ideas for counters and uh, adaptations as your subject becomes more resistant. Now the fourth type of flow drill that we can use is what I term a circuit flow. Basically this involves going from technique A to technique B. We go from B to C and then C will lead back to A. 
You could have two, three, five, any number of techniques in it. But the idea is that it's circular. So here, for example, we start off in a mount, we go back, back with that same figure four top shoulder lock or that V lock, the Americana. From there, we imagine the subject slips out, pulls out or escapes. We're already in position for the underhook. So I go for my underhook arm bar. And there's many different variations, how I can post my legs on the closer far side. I can barrel roll, I can dig my bone into the tendon. From there, we imagine the subject now slips out. And when I lose it, I reestablish base and mount, and now I repeat the circuit on the other side. Figure four V-lock, slips out, underhook, choir position. This type of circuit drill allows me to go from beginning to end over and over. The end becomes the beginning of the next sequence. In this case, it allows me to work symmetrically from one side to the other, and it really is great for building flow. So of course, remember that any circuit will just involve a sequence of movements that brings you back to the beginning. In this case, we said technique A to B to C. And specifically in this case, we were dealing with a mount going into a V-lock, going into an underhook, and then returning back to mount. Our fifth type of flow set is what I term a tree flow. This is basically like a tree. We have our base technique or our trunk, and then we have potential branches or places that we can go from that trunk technique. So if we go back to the same skill set that we've been looking at, and we started off with our mounted position with our figure four V shoulder lock, that would be our trunk technique, our base technique. From this position, we could look at different variables. First, our partner could escape and we could see that we could go for our underhook armbar, which we've already seen. But then we could return to our base technique and imagine if our partner bucked out to the other side. We could then look at allowing them to roll in their stomach, keeping hip control, get our hooks in, and go for a rear choke. That would be a second completely different escape. A third would be if we stopped them midway through, brought them back onto their back, pinning their arm across their chest, and we could have our chest lock. So from that simple base technique of our figure four V lock, we see that we have three completely different possibilities based on how our opponent would resist and potentially escape. And our sixth and final type of flow set is what I term a free flow set. Now the common mistake here is that people think free flow means do whatever you want. But if you just let students do anything they want, they will usually not work on what you've just isolated. So it should begin with a targeted review of the techniques that you have been isolating for that given session. You should tell students to prioritize those while allowing them to include and incorporate any other known techniques that they have in their arsenal. This is a great way for them to re-explore and review those techniques that are most familiar, that stuck in them, that work best for them. It allows them to make the decision to isolate those things perhaps that they were having the greatest difficulty with. But more than that, by incorporating outside technique, it gives them workarounds and it lets them find solutions. So if something doesn't work for their size, their strength or their skill, they can find other alternatives that work for them. This inclusion and integration with our existing arsenal is a key way of making new material part of our instinctive repertoire. So it's very important when we do free flow drills, we don't just allow them to default to their preferences. We still want to require them to isolate the techniques and review the techniques that we've been focusing on that, that given seminar or class or period. We give them specific objectives, but we allow them to break the boundaries, break the perimeters of that exercise and include other preferences and other strengths that they may have. Now let's review these six basic flow drills that we can use. The first that we saw was the basic countermeasure drill. This is the idea of starting off with a technique, then after some acquisition we allow the opponent to counter, then we return to our basic core technique with a workaround and adapt, have another counter, adapt, have another counter, and adapt. So the idea here is that we are always proceeding on the same path. We saw the example of a basic mount escape. We saw that the top the resistant opponent could shrug their arm out, could apply grapevines, they could crisscross their ankles, they could flatten out, but they were fundamentally always motivating us to return to our base technique 
the mount escape to deviate off as little as possible and return to that core technique as soon as possible. Our second type of flow drill was the volley drill. Now here we started off with a basic technique, but now when our opponent would counter, we could go to any other alternative technique. We weren't trying to necessarily proceed with one given path, but were rather adapting each time to the counter. So the subject's counter allows us to go in a multitude of directions, like a tennis match. So in our particular example, we went for a far side body lock, we had an arm block, we adapted with an arm stuff body lock to a high underhook, we then adapted to a close side body hit lock with a chance to go to the back, and we had our opponent bridge and sag to counter. Our third type of flow was a chain flow. Now this is any sequence of movements that can be linked together. So anything that has a logical sequential order. The key thing to remember is that these are just mental maps and that we're not expecting ourselves to ever respond with this particular continuous link. This is just for linkage in our brain. So in our particular chain flow we had technique A and from that base technique we saw that we could go to any subsequent technique, B to C to D. And again, it doesn't mean that we think in a fight we're going to go A, B, C, D. We could start off on technique E. We could go forward to F or backwards to D. It's just this basic idea of mapping out a technique. Our fourth flow was a circuit flow. And a circuit flow is any sequence of techniques that returns the practitioner to the same initial base technique. So we have a starting movement, in our case it was a figure four V-lock, and that whatever we did, whatever we encountered, however we adapted, after two or three techniques, we return back to that, that starting technique, our figure four V-lock. So we have a base technique that leads to a secondary technique, possibly to a third or a fourth, but that that ultimately resets and restarts. So this circular type of drill allows us to continuously cycle through uh, the same small body of techniques, but it also allows us to really more quickly integrate adaptability, and it shows us that we, we have quite simply an A plan, a B plan, and a C plan. Our fifth flow drill was a tree flow. That involves having a trunk or a base technique and different branches, different ideas that can shoot off of that fundamental base technique. So you could do this with any core technique and the idea here is that they don't necessarily flow together but they all flow from the same origin. Our origin in our example was a V-lock. We saw that could lead to an underhook, it could lead to a choke, or it could lead to a chest lock. Finally, our sixth flow was free flow. And we saw that free flow was directed, educated, free exploration. It was not simply doing anything that you wanted. You still had to have some degree of isolation, some degree of what we term targeted review, but that included with those, those parameters, you could allow the student to integrate and incorporate any other workarounds, alternatives, or techniques that they had mastered. One area of teaching and communication in general that is often completely overlooked is the use of questions. Now, there are fundamentally two types of questions, what are termed open-ended and closed questions. A closed question can be answered with yes, no, right, wrong, something very simple. An open-ended question is something that requires explanation. And by requiring explanation, it requires understanding. I can easily use closed questions, yes, no questions, and not in any way confirm someone's understanding. Does that make sense? That's a yes, no question. Now, a lot of people, a lot of teachers will say, yes, no questions have no place in the classroom. Closed questions are no good because it allows a student to simply pass by and fake their way through things going, yep, totally get it. And then as soon as you walk away, they go, uh, uh, if, uh, mm, and they don't understand it. So what's very, very important is that we realize there is a time and place for both. Open questions, concept checking questions that get to the meat of what you're doing are imperative during the learning cycle. If I am teaching something to a group or to an individual and I say to them, now what do I have to do next? This requires them to think and if they go, uh, I could say, should I reach up or should I reach down? Down, why? 
uh, and if it should have been up, I'll say, no, reaching down is dangerous. Why do you think it's dangerous? And I'll try to let them, I'll leave that pregnant pause and I'll leave it there and I'll force them to really think about what they're saying. And then I'll say, what could I do next? And then why do we do this? And then what's good about this? Can you see a danger here? These are all good open questions that will check to see if the student has understanding. Generally, I'll, I'll deliver them to the group, but I'm never shy to signal, single out people and to say, John, and what's next? Nope, John's answering. And I'll wait, and I'll put pressure on John. And then I'll say, and what about this, Delilah? And I'll go to the next person. So I'll alternate between auditing the entire group and addressing the individual. If I'm coaching one-on-one, -on -one, of course, it's always going to be with the individual. But even in group settings, I'll target people, specifically when I'm teaching younger learners who tend to be more shy and to hide their errors. Now, that being said, there are times for closed-ended questions. I am famously guilty of saying, does that make sense? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? when it's time to wrap up a lesson, right? Um, especially if you're, you're giving a seminar, you're giving a lecture, you're giving a class, even in a private lesson, there is a time when they need to physically go forward. We spoke about auditory, visual, and kinesthetic learners. Some people will get lost in auditory loops. They'll just keep asking questions, asking questions, asking questions, and the problem is they never get to physically doing things. Some people will spend the majority of their class talking to their partner. These are verbal people, auditory people, and that's normal and that's okay, that's who they are. But you need to be extra stringent on these people to go over, talk to them quickly, engage them for a second, and then get them to show you some physical repetitions. You need to maybe ask them a few questions, open-ended questions about what are you doing. Hey, let me ask you a question. If you were to do it this way, or could you do me a favor? You're a bit smaller. I want to see if this special technique works for you. And you give them some auditory excitement, some auditory appeal, and then force them to get into the physical. But what matters is that you understand there is a time for closed questions. A good educator doesn't want to get distracted and allow their lesson to go off on tangents. I'm going to give you the best example I have. It's a famous one. I was at an outdoor training camp in the martial arts. We were doing some wilderness survival stuff. It was super intuitive. We were learning stealth work. We had been up like 16 hours. We hadn't been sleeping much. It's 2 in the morning. It's dark. We've learned about acclimatizing our eyes to the darkness, not looking at the moon directly. We're listening to sounds. We're in the zone. And there's like, you know, a hundred of us sitting there. And the instructor is giving this very soft-spoken lecture. And it's just rising above the four sounds. And every word is profound. And everybody's in the zone. And you just feel so connected. And then he says, it is one of the greatest quotes of all times, he finishes this entire speech and everyone's exhausted. And it just kind of goes done. Everybody feels it and the whole group kind of breathes in unison. Well, the whole group minus one person, I guess. Um, and he says famously, let's not injure the silence with our footsteps. and Let's return to our bunks, to our rooms, quietly. And everybody slowly starts to get up soundlessly and then from the back of the group, totally off topic, totally out of sync, a guy says, excuse me, um, I had a question. Uh, if you were attacked by wolves, how would you defend against a pack? And the instructor, being super academic and super um, knowledgeable, goes, yeah, uh, when attacked by, and he goes off into this list and everybody kind of sighs and, and collapses. And the ending of this whole night was ruined by this one person who was just out of sync with the universe and the entire group. That's an example of when a, a good closed-ended question would have been good. You know, politicians will say things like, that's a really good point and I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Or thanks for bringing that up, I'll be coming that to that at the end. And they'll put it off to the end, sometimes they won't come back to it in politicians' cases, but they, they defer it and then they try to do it at a different point. So if you can't defer it, a closed-ended question is usually the easiest way to end it. But if I don't want to invite it, if I don't want to just have constant sort of distractions, I'll say, all right, guys, does that sound good? Does that make sense? I'll do a few very fast concept checking questions. So what do we do first? And then what do we do? And what's important here? Does that make sense? Excellent. Boom. So there's a natural closure of funneling, and then I'll go forward. During the